Okay, um, welcome everyone. Today we have with us a uh, special guest presenter, Christopher Jetty, who I've known for a long time. Um, since my days back in family student housing in Santa Barbara. So Christopher and I were both in school at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and now we are no longer in school there. So Christopher describes himself in his bio, which I won't read too much of because I think he's going to read some of it too, as a curator of lovely sounds, creating work as a composer and new media artist. So he works at the intersection of art and technology, and that's why we have uh, a specific interest in hearing from him during this forum. And with that, I'm going to turn it over. I'll remind everyone that the way we like to do this is to mute microphones. And if you want to um, ask a question or exclaim that you are excited about something or whatever, um, you can just put that in the chat, which I will leave open. And um, Christopher can decide whether or not he wants to address the comment or the question or whether he wants to um, politely ignore it, it is up to him. And with that, I will turn it over. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Um, let me just ask real quickly, what is the name of this forum? Or under um, I guess it's, I guess it's the, um, the Music Technology um, Guest Presentation Fall 2020. Great, okay. okay. <laughs> I think that's what it's called in the okay. YouTube playlist that we have. So after that's done, I will Perfect. upload to YouTube as well and I'll send you a link. Okay. Perfect. Just wanted to know what context we're in. Thanks. Um, greetings all. Uh, I am indeed Christopher Jetty and um, I'm going to talk today about a, a bunch of things that I've made and sort of how I got to making those things. Um, so as uh, Dr. Thompson said, please throw comments up there. Um, I'll probably grab them most at the end. Um, so uh, let's just test the audio, which we've already done. Um, so is this working? Is this not working for anyone? That's always the, right? Okay. And that's um, probably San Francisco Yacht Club. And that's where they sailed the America's Cup out of when America took back the cup uh, about six years ago. Um, so the first foiling catamarans um, that, uh, Oracle, Team Oracle um, insisted on. So that's a little bit of uh, local stuff for you. Okay, so um, I am beginning with this. I call this sort of a personal totem. Um, I'm gonna talk today sort of about who I am, where I come from, then a little bit of the philosophy that I employ when I'm uh, creating. And then I'll actually delve into some pieces and, and show you um, some stuff that I've made. Um, so I began my training as an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. This down at the bottom here, that guy, that's Chief Oshkosh. That's who the town was named for. Um, and next to that actual actual image of him, which I really like, um, the gorgeous sepia tone, um, is a statue. That statue is located in the park uh, right next to um, uh, Lake Winnebago, which is where I taught undergraduate, or I taught my way through undergraduate. Um, I was working at the Oshkosh Yacht Club teaching sailing during the summer and then studying violin uh, performance as an undergraduate. Um, I also did a lot of classes in art and um, a lot of classes in uh, religious studies. Uh, I was just too lazy to fill out the paperwork to get the minors in those degrees. Um, so I kind of wandered around a lot of different academic disciplines. Um, and at the end of that six and a half years, um, I moved to Boston. So this next image you see here um, is uh, a couple of things from Boston. The first thing I did upon graduating with a music degree is promptly stopped uh, any music in my life whatsoever, with the exception of going to concerts. Um, uh, and the thing that I started doing was working in retail. And I um, was uh, working at Eastern Mountain Sports. And uh, that's a store that sells uh, rock climbing, ice climbing, and mountaineering gear. And so I, I really got into this um, uh, this world of uh, hanging from a rope or your fingers on the side of a mountain and trying not to kill yourself. Um, and that sort of informs a lot of how I look at gear. 
Um, so when I look at an audio interface, I don't just look at, you know, sort of the specs. Um, I also think, you know, how would that do um, outside and 20 below, you know, like I have, I have sort of a, a way of thinking about these things that's maybe a little different than most people. Um, at the end of like three, four years of working in retail and climbing a lot, um, I started to do master's degree at the New England Conservatory. So that's NEC. And I worked, I was there for two years. Um, my then fiance was in University of Washington in Seattle. So I'd kind of flip and flop between the coasts. Um, but that degree was really uh, kind of a mind opening experience getting to work with uh, Robert Kogan. Um, I'll say of the ice climbing picture, that's actually a frozen waterfall in Valdez, Alaska. Um, years after I had lived um, in Boston and we moved up to Alaska, um, I got to go to the Valdez Ice Festival. Um, and that is um, 60 meters of frozen water. Um, and I got to climb on it and I was terribly out of shape. So fortunately there were people there setting up ropes uh, to keep people like me safe, uh, but it's really a lot of fun and sort of like a amazing thing to do. Um, so after my master's degree at in Boston, I moved out to um, the West Coast and we promptly drove from Seattle up to Alaska. And we moved every six weeks while my wife uh, who's trained as a physician was doing rotations. Um, this meant I had a lot of time to compose music. And um, let me tell you, there weren't a lot of people in Anchorage, Alaska who were interested in my Boston new music chops. Um, so I took up uh, the practice of um, learning to use a computer. And at the end of a year of sitting by myself with a computer uh, in apartments around Alaska and um, Seattle, I had been accepted to a PhD program, and that was in UC Santa Barbara. So many wonderful things happened to me in Santa Barbara, one of them being meeting Dr. Thompson. Uh, but another wonderful thing was I was able to um, uh, co-host and organize and do all the legwork for a uh, weekend long symposium on the pioneers of electronic music. And so this picture is my old MacBook Pro, the one that I had when I was in Santa Barbara. And I consider this my electronic music diploma. That, those are signatures on there. Um, and the top one is Jean-Claude Rizé, Max Matthews is below that, John Chowning, Curtis Rhodes, and Clarence Barlow. Um, so I hosted this program and they all gave talks and then I ran a, a concert off of that computer. And I think that comp computer is actually kind of just frozen in that mode um, of like, there's one logic session that holds that concert and that's basically all that computer can do now. Um, but uh, of course I finished my PhD and the next thing that I did was promptly stop any music activity. Um, the last two years of working on my PhD, I was living in Palo Alto. Um, that's where I currently live now. I'm in my studio at home. And um, we, uh, my wife and myself had been um, sailing in the Bay area and I taught her to sail when I, we first moved to Santa Barbara. Um, so sailing in the Bay Area, we realized it was a great opportunity to buy a boat, um, which I don't recommend doing, but if you're gonna be persistent and, and obstinate, um, go for it. Um, and so this is our 36 foot catch from 1978. Um, and we spent a year um, taking that boat down to Mexico and back. Um, we had the wonderful um, opportunity to uh, be making our final voyage from Cabo San Lucas back to um, San Diego and halfway through our engine blew out. And so we sailed back down to Mexico, uh, repaired it, went up to a yard and hauled the boat out and drove it back to uh, San Francisco. Actually, I didn't drive it. It was on the back of a semi truck. It weighs 10 tons. Um, and one of the things you need to do when you do that is you need to transfer from Mexican carrier to an American carrier. Um, and the place where we did that was in Tucson. So uh, I took a bus up from San Carlos, Mexico, along with everyone who was going to work at Disneyland. There's actually a two-face of bus line, uh, which is sort of like Greyhound, but it runs from Mexico up into all these different parts of California. And you actually get a very different perspective of uh, the United States if you come in on Tufesa. Um, you also get stopped multiple times for uh, at the border and uh, all sorts of ID checks throughout the Southwest. Um, 
so when I was in Tucson, I um, called up a friend of mine, Angus Forbes, who had just gotten a job there. And he was just moving down. I saw it on Facebook, actually, of all places. And um, uh, I said, hey, Angus, um, I'm going to be in Tucson. Uh, you want to hang out and maybe I crash at your place? He's like, well, I don't have a place yet, but I will tomorrow. Um, so I stayed with Angus for about a week. And um, we spent a lot of time talking and uh it turned out that uh, he wanted to start a lab and he needed people who could um, do interesting art projects. So I became a, um, a postdoc at the University of Arizona. So for a year, I lived in Palo Alto for one week, then in Tucson for a week, and then back and forth, back and forth. Um, and the image you see above that, uh, this one here in red, um, that is from a piece called V to T to D. So that uh, was written for uh, Kellen Thomas, who is a saxophone player. Um, and it uh, actually implements live video granulation. So you may have heard of um, uh, auditory uh, or granular synthesis, right? Um, so I have some expertise in that area. And Angus is a um, creative coder in the visual domain. And we came to this idea of trying to implement granular synthesis in the visual domain. And so that's what you're actually seeing there. Um, so um, that's that piece. I won't talk about it today. I can give you a link if you're interested. Um, after a year of doing that uh, commute, um, we moved to Alaska again, my wife and myself. And um, I was no longer in an academic context. I was actually working with several other people in a group called the Light Brigade. And this is an image from a piece where we installed it in a park. And I'll show you that later. Um, after two years in Alaska, I was accepted to do an artist residency at the University of Iowa. Actually, it's the Grant Wood Fellowship uh, Program. And so I was the multidisciplinary artist in residence. And I made several significant pieces that year. Um, the one on the, well, this side, we'll call it the right side, is um, from uh, an opera that I made for my friend Nathan, who I did an undergraduate with at Oshkosh. Um, down at the bottom, right? So he teaches there still. Um, so when I went back for the performance of that, I got to see that statue of Chief Oshkosh and wander around the park there of, of my undergraduate degree days. Um, that opera we toured to about 12 different places. I believe Dr. Thompson heard an act of that at Seamus one year. Um, and uh, the other significant thing I did, um, and this is a piece I'll talk about later so you can get a sense of it, is um, fluorescence, and that turns um, sound into visual back into sound. Um, and so that's a, that's a smoke cloud of a waveform emanating from the bell of a brass instrument. Um, after being in Iowa for a year, I came back to Palo Alto and uh, uh, we decided to settle here for the time being. And um, I took a job at the Center for Computer Research, Music, and Acoustics. That's um, known colloquially as Karma, um, and that's at Stanford University. Um, I was a staff member there, and I worked on a lot of different things. Um, the things that maybe the most meaningful for me, I ran the Max Lab for uh, a year, and that's uh, named for Max Matthews. When he retired from Bell Labs, he came out here and had this sort of early tinkerer hack space. Um, and so, um, you know, like, I, I guess the story that maybe sums it up for me is, you know, Max was going hard of hearing, and he wanted to sort of improve his ability to hear around the lab. So he took a hard hat, and he mounted some microphones on it and wore headphones, and he would walk around, you know, like, 11 o'clock at night, you're in there, you know, in a studio working, and Max walks in with this rig on, and he's like, what are you doing? You know, like, that's, you know, that's sort of Max's tinkering, right? Um, he also did some other very significant things um, th that I'm sure you're aware of. So, um, but Max is just like this amazing spirit. And so it was really an honor to, you know, sort of continue this tradition of uh, a space where people could think strange things and make strange things. Um, that image is from his notebook. Uh, it's a picture of uh, the yacht club in New Jersey where they, he kept his boat and uh, that's looking out onto the water. So he would draw that. I've gone through his notebooks because they're in the special collections at Stanford. And it's actually pretty funny. Like, you know, he'd be in these meetings at IBM and he'd be drawing the craziest stuff. Um, I'll just say that. Um, 
And uh, the other thing that I did um, is you see this, um, this picture of a concert space that's, um, it's about 100 people uh, on a really good day, but mostly it's like a 60, 50 person concert venue. Um, and it's formerly the ballroom. Um, and uh, what we did is we installed a 64 channel ambisonic array. So that's a dome that goes over you um, for implementing ambisonics. And um, the thing that I had to figure out, um, nope, slide didn't change. I'm still, yep, it's this guy right here. Um, uh, that, um, that array was my, my role in that array was figuring out the logistics of how to hang these speakers and hide all the cables and put the audio interfaces up in the rafters and that sort of stuff. Um, and so then finally, um, after leaving, uh, Karma after two years, I, um, began focusing on sort of my, um, independent artist career. And so I'm um, talking to you today from this building up here. That's my studio in the backyard. Um, I built that um, and the deck around it. And uh, no, that's not my water table. That's my daughter's water table. Um, uh, so I spent a lot of time sort of, you know, uh, figuring out how to use power tools and different ways to kill yourself with, um, you know, saws and stuff. And I've, I've, I've kept all my fingers. I'm very proud of that. Um, uh, but um, in addition to this studio, um, I built this, uh, I took our garage and uh, turned it into a one bedroom uh, rental. And so um, one of the ways that I've um, been able to sort of have a career as a composer is to be renting our garage as a one bedroom uh, rental unit, in addition to, um, you know, commission money and that sort of stuff. And so I think it's important to sort of point out the reality of being an artist today. Um, you have to diversify your portfolio. Um, and the picture in the middle uh, is um, sort of my latest or one of my latest obsessions. That's um, a picture of Greenland. Um, I was flying to Norway for um, a rehearsal. And that is a picture I shot out the window. I'm very interested in the Arctic and sort of as ground zero for climate change. So, all right, that's who I am. Um, I'm going to talk about some technology. Um, you are all involved in technology in some way or another. Um, so I'd like to begin by sort of um, pointing to that word technology and asking you what does it, what is it, right? What do you understand technology to be? Um, and so actually what I'll ask you to do is take 30 seconds and sort of jot down your thoughts on what technology is in your mind. So you have this sort of image. And then you can contrast that with the things that I bring up. So I'll give you 30 seconds here. You could throw it in a text document or on a piece of paper, whatever you like. Okay, so I hope you all have a sense of what you think technology is. Um, the, part of the reason I start this way is uh, I think it's important to think critically about things that we do um, and uh, what we do involves technology. Um, and so um, I'm gonna give you sort of my sense of what I think technology is and how it plays a role in what I make. Um, and hopefully that could be an interesting contrast to uh, your thoughts. Uh, and maybe we can talk about that stuff at the end, actually be circle back to that. So, okay, um, technology for me. I'll begin with this quote from David Krakauer. He runs the uh, complexity um, or the Santa Fe Institute, which studies complexity. Um, and uh, I, I want to co-op the embody physical analogies component of this, but I want to do due diligence and share the whole quote with you because I think it's actually quite insightful. Um, this is from a podcast where um, they're looking at uh, COVID and the uh, complexity of how it exists as an, a virus. Um, it's economic, it's social, and it's, um, uh, well, it's implications, right? And sort of disentangling it and thinking about it critically. Um, so he's talking about the models and he begins, uh, 
what we do when we build mathematical models or models of any kind is make analogies. And so David was trained as a mathematician among other things. And so he's, he's specifically referencing that. Um, if you look at the early theories of the solar system and the cosmos, they were based on clocks, right? In other words, mechanical devices. We use the model, we use to model the motions of the planets. And so hence we have our armillary spheres, our astrolabes and all these extraordinary devices that are in some sense embodied physical analogies. Um, so I like that he brings this up for several reasons. One, the embodied physical analogies, that phrase is just brilliant. Um, I, it really, it's, it's, to me, it's, I've been wrestling with for years how to say we have a thought and we manifest it in the physical world and that's, that's what art is. Um, that's what a piece of music is. That's what a piano is. That's what a hammer is. Um, so I want to, I want to borrow that phrase from him, but I also want to point to the fact that um, he points out um, early scientists were modeling the universe as a mechanical device where planets were on tracks spinning around with elaborate gear systems, right? Um, and that's not how we think about the universe. We have a completely different understanding. And as we look back at sort of earlier understandings of the universe, we often, or we might think that's rather absurd. Why did they think that way? And of course, it's because the latest scientific knowledge, the latest intellectual knowledge was the uh, framework in which they thought. Um, so uh, being humble human beings, we should recognize that sort of the way that we view the universe um, in 200, 300 years is going to be just as ridiculous. Um, so um, I like to sort of have that in the back of my head. Um, the next thing I want to do is talk about a piece of technology that I spent a lot of time thinking about, um, and I mean a hammer. Um, so there's a lot of different facets to a hammer. Um, so uh, we can think about hammers beginning as a rock, right? So you have a caveman picks up a rock, bang, or you know somebody like out in the bush trying to survive has a rock, using it as a hammer. Um, and the the sort of first um, improvement or iteration beyond uh, taking just a rock and turning it into a hammer is to bind it to a shaft. So to take a piece of wood and then some raw hide and wrap it. And now you have a device where you're less likely to smash your other hand while you're using the hammer. And that's a huge improvement, right? Like you go from being able to implement the banging of something to now do it without, you know, possibly removing fingers. Um, and then uh, there's the idea of Thor's hammer, right? So now we're talking about this mythical god hammer, right? And also the implications of that. Um, a completely different headspace, but we're still talking about hammers. Uh, the gavel of justice, okay? This is um, has a very acoustic function, right? Call to order. Um, but it's also a hammer that punctuates um, you know, a death sentence or retribution for someone's death. And so this has a really profound uh, role that it plays in our society. Um, then there's John Henry's steel driving hammer. Here's a folk hero who uh, was competing uh, with a hammer against a steel or against a, a steam machine to drive a tunnel through um, a rock uh, mountain. And apparent, the, the story goes that he, um, he won, but he died in the process. He had a heart attack. And so this is, you know, this really is, is a story of, of man and uh, his struggles uh, with technology. Uh, then we have the die cast claw hammer. Um, this is probably the hammer that you all have in your toolbox uh, and you're familiar with. And this hammer, um, now we're talking about something that's been, you know, really highly refined and designed. It, the construction of it is happening in a plant. It may not even involve any humans, you know, physically constructing it, it may be completely automated. Um, and we're talking about uh, something that's designed for economic consumption, right? So it's not just about its function, it's also about will it be the shiniest and most appealing one on the shelf that you'll pick up and choose to buy? And can we ship it from China to the, you know, to the United States? in a limited amount of time and you know all these other considerations. So this really brings into focus sort of the modern situation in a way, right? Um, Jackhammer, very specialized, um, implements a really amazing amount of power in a really compact situation. Um, I hope you never have to use one. They're not a lot of fun. Be very careful if you do. Um, 
Then we have a medical knee hammer, right? So this is a little orange rubber triangle. Um, and now you're talking about a device that's diagnostic, right? Let's find out about your reflexes. This is something meant to not bang a nail into place, but to assess the uh, health of a human, right? So a very different connotation. And then we have the felt face piano hammer. And now we're talking about the touch of a musician being extended through uh, a mechanical device to strike a string. Um, so that's that's just a hammer, right? Um, and there's there's sort of other ways to you know sort of draw this out. This is something I've been working on for a while. I just kind of keep a document of these things. The one I didn't mention in the other talk was down here on the bottom, MC hammer. That's a completely different thing, right? Um, uh, but there's there's sort of a lot of different ways of thinking about that simple technology. Okay, so then how do we think about like a sound interface or you know a mouse or a, you know all these sorts of things, right? That are um, well, the the hopefully the the lesson we get from thinking about a hammer is that there's there's a lot of different perspectives and we need to be considerate of those or at least honor the ones that are relevant for us in our creative process. Um, and by creative, I'm I'm speaking as a composer, but I understand you know the the coding, the development of software, the, the performance, the creation of music, all to be the creative process. Um, I'll say in my own process, I tend to think about uh, software and listening as the main technologies. Um, listening has a lot of different facets. There's sort of the intellectual, there's the acoustic reality of sound propagating through a medium. Um, and, uh, you know, list goes on and on. And then software, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. Okay, let's talk about some music. So um, I often have a goal. This is one way I've written it down. Um, and what I like to think about with this is that uh, my role as an artist is to balance sort of the contemporary situation uh, with the historical. And the way I bring historical into it is uh, through intellectual reflection, uh, you know, thinking about things. Um, and also the fact that, you know, I trained as an artist, um, you know, I played the violin for 28 years. Um, I've been composing for, oh, wow, um, 20 years. Um, uh, you know, there's the discipline of uh, how I climb mountains. This is discipline about how I manipulate a sailboat in the middle of the ocean. These things all influence how I act and how I move through uh, a problem. And so that discipline is, is a historical reality. I didn't, you know, it's not like my teachers just sort of invented a new system. No, they inherited one that goes way, way back. Um, so there, there's a reality there um, that I have to honor. Um, and the goal in making something is really, you know, can I make something that's going to have a positive impact and really talk to humans now uh, and talk to humans maybe 200 years from now? Um, so I, I sort of view myself as a, a, um, a newscaster talking about sort of uh, what's going on right now, but in an abstract aesthetic sense. Um, yeah, so I, I love reading the news when I get to listen to, you know, Mozart commenting on the day's activities. Um, okay, when I make uh, pieces, the thing that I've settled on, uh, my main process is translation. Um, and um, I'll show you different ways I translate, you know, physical movement into sound or sound uh, recording into notation, um, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, it always seems to sort of come back to this idea of translation. So uh, I found this quote in Curtis Rhodes' um, electronic composition book uh, published in 2016. Um, and I really like, I like it a lot. And he's quoting uh, biologist D.R.C. Thompson from 1942. Um, and let's just have a go at this. A bridge was once upon a time a loose heap of pillars and rods and rivets of steel. But the identity of these is lost, just as if it had fused into a solid mass once the bridge is built. The biologist, as well as the philosopher, as well as the artist, learns to recognize that the whole is not merely the sum of its parts, for it is not a bundle of parts, but an organization of parts. Um, having put most of the parts into the room I'm sitting in, you know, I can, like all the screws and all the nails and all the two by fours, um, I have that knowledge in my head, but I don't see it that way. This is the space where I make 
things. Um, so it's kind of a different way of thinking about it. Um, and I'm sure you have that reality as well. Okay. Um, I'm going to begin with a video of um, how I translate um, a recording into notation. And this is a way to segue into the first piece that I want to talk about, uh, Psionic. This is a piece for oboe along with electronics. Um, I will I, I will often say throughout this talk with electronics, and what I'm generally referring to is electronics uh, being fixed. Um, so, you know, sort of a press plane, it just goes, as well as live. So this live processing, generative processes, um, where I'm, you know, maybe compose, I'm turning on a system and it's generating sound for 20 seconds or the entirety of a piece. Um, so with this piece, um, I was writing for uh, a friend of mine, the oboe player, and you'll, you'll see her in a moment. She came from Florida and was really sort of obsessed with um, uh, frogs and sort of the, her recollections of being in the swamp. And so that was a starting place for this piece. So I take recordings of frogs in a swamp and turn it into uh, a score. So here's how that goes. Okay, so an important thing to point out um, that that mouse control, you know, like moving it left and right, uh, that is like really innocuous, right? It's really stupid, like, oh, I can move the mouse over here and I can move the mouse over here. But actually that's my interface for performing the transcription. Um, you know, that, that length of how, you know, sort of like those, I don't know, five seconds of, of uh, notes, um, I have, you know, to make a, a 10 minute piece, I have a lot of those. And so I go through and do section by section and really listen to the sounds and make decisions and rehearse and move my mouse back and forth to get just the right performance. And after doing that like four or five times, then I record that, spit out the score. Okay, good. This is one piece of raw material. Then I build up a folder um, of raw material and then I start to assemble it into a piece. So that's, that's sort of my process. Um, um, yeah, so let's show you a little bit about this piece um, or show you the opening of it. Um, and uh, I mentioned that it's with electronics. One of the other uh, other components of electronics here is that there's a live video. Um, the live video is an animation of images like this one that you see here. Um, and I'll show you how that was made. Um, I mean, when we talk about manifesting sound, that is quite literally that. Um, but uh, yeah, let's just show you how this piece opens so you have it in your head. And I'll tell you to sort of put on your um, mental concert hall listening filter. Okay, so this is, you know, this is designed to listen to in a concert hall. Um, this is not like radio music or something. So here we go.
So um, you can't see it, uh, but she's wearing a headband. Um, and that headband I'm using to track the acceleration in X, Y, and Z dimensions. Um, and uh, as a performer, I thought a lot about motion, right? Like, so as a violinist, you think about moving your fingers like a couple millimeters and the impact that has on your sound. Um, and you can apply that sort of like instrument that you're intimately familiar with, um, or, you know, the steering wheel of a car at 80 miles an hour, you know, you move it a little bit, has a big impact. Um, and so uh, compose, or sorry, performers are very expressive through their movement and their movement has implications for sound. Um, and because they're already doing that, I wanted to take advantage of it. And so I, I basically grab her head movement and I map that uh, control data to, um, uh, let's see, both uh, live processing algorithms and then some sound generation. Um, the other thing about that headband is it's giving me her brain activity. Um, so. I initially had come up with the idea that she would think certain things and she'd be able to like manifest sound. Um, don't ask a performer to perform on a different instrument. Uh, not a good plan. Um, so what I ended up doing was recognizing that, you know, she's going to be on stage, she's going to be thinking, um, and that those thoughts are going to change throughout the performance and that's going to have an impact on uh, her, her process. Um, or, or sorry, on her thought process. So uh, I can take those brain waves and I can map that to an FM synthesis algorithm uh, that's generating the low frequency material that you heard right there at the beginning. Um, so I'm often thinking about how I can take information from the live performance and sort of make that manifest that in sound, as well as sort of all the other um, pre-compositional things that I, I pull into the piece. Um, can you reiterate how you're analyzing the frogs? What parameter does the mouse control? Ah, I should go back and answer this, sorry. Um, what it, the mouse controls how fast uh, I'm updating the analysis of the frog sound. So the frogs are just playing and I'm having uh, basically a window open and say, hey, what's the frequency now? Hey, what's the frequency now? And that's either happening really fast or really slow based on where I have the mouse, right? Okay. Um, so, yeah, when, oh, I should say about that animation too for Psionic, that is based on these prints that I'm about to show you how they're made, um, but that was made by Angus Forbes. Um, so I made this piece when I was at University of Iowa and uh, Angus was then, I guess, at University of Chicago. Um, so um, I sent him these images that I had made and uh, asked him to do an animation with the uh, video granulation. Uh, system we developed. Um, there's a paper on it if you'd like to know more of the specifics, uh, technical side of it. Um, turn my mic off. I'll just say uh, this is carbonic clouds. Um, and we made these 11 by 17 prints, um, which are... Uh, they're ink on paper, and the ink represents the contours of a standing wave in a puddle of water. That puddle of water is in a big metal sheet, and um, I used transducers to find the resonant frequency of that mass. So let me uh, play the video for you here. So that's how that sort of came to be. And uh, I believe I said, 
I made those in conjunction with Terry Conrad, if I didn't, um, should acknowledge him. He's a printmaker who now teaches at the University of Iowa. We were Grant Wood Fellows together, and part of our residency was, um, our residency package, um, was that we uh, were given a place to live. So he had the upstairs of the house, I had the downstairs. Um, and every Tuesday night, we would get together and um, make these wonderful sounds that you heard. Um, when we showed these pieces, everyone wanted to know what they sounded like. It's like, no, you really don't want to know what they sound like. Um, I mean, you just heard it's kind of atrocious. And actually, we would wear like earplugs and then ear muffs over earplugs because it was like super loud to get it to do what you need to do. Um, but uh, for me, the, the whole point of that was to sort of manifest the acoustic reality of, of sound waves propagating through a medium and to show that and to explore that space. And that's, you know, I think what these successfully do. Okay, a different set of work, um, the line project. Um, so I've done several iterations. Um, these are all the different people or different things you're gonna see. Um, there's actually, I remembered yesterday, there's another piece that uses this. I'd forgot about it when I initially made this video. And so uh, in addition to Catherine, Becky, Michael, uh, my solo piece in the Arctic Sustain Ensemble piece, there's also Utukuk. Um, so you'll see that in the video as well. Um, but the basic idea here is that when you look at a video, you're looking at a series of pixels. Um, you can uh, say, take this line. Ooh, that's a really unstraight line, um, right? So there's a line going through me there. And um, if we read that in grayscale, so black and white, um, the black, uh, can be considered one and the white can, can be considered zero. So we have like, you know, this awesome thing that we get here. Okay, so that's what that might look like in terms of values between zero and one. Um, that looks a lot to me like a sound wave. Um, and in fact, if you repeat it at audio rate, it is a sound wave. Um, so I took that basic concept and I made um, uh, sort of a little max patch that would implement that. And then I worked with the dancer, Catherine Hawthorne. Um, she and I started this piece oh, a long time ago. And um, we were talking about sort of how Edward Weston photographer really focused on, you know, the notions of light and darkness in his photographs. They're all black and white photographs. Um, and that was really a sort of source of inspiration and starting point for thinking about how do we perceive movement in space? You know, like, is it just light being reflected? Um, so um, we kind of kept going, kept going and did a residency in Chicago where we made sort of the first version of this. And then you'll see in this video, um, she and I made a, uh, a version that we performed at Karma um, in Ambisonics. Um, but this also can just work in sort of, you know, a, a, a solo situation where it's in stereo or in mono. Um, so it's gone through many different iterations. Let me show you how this piece works. Oh, and I, I'll say real quickly, this is a, um, a series of different works. Um, so maybe apply a listening filter where you know you're going to see snippets of a piece. The bigness of Alaska makes us feel lost the way looking up at the stars makes some of us feel like we're going insane. The following spring, a Rasmussen Foundation commission drew us off the streets and briefly into a traditional theater setting for the first time to create a dramatic monochromatic 
minimalist work of dance, abstract imagery, and a cascading musical composition in which the dancers' movements generated both the sound and distorted the geometric projections. The piece was performed in front of an audience of artists receiving recognition for their creative contributions and ideas. Okay, so kind of a, a leveraging of that same technology in a bunch of different situations. Um, the thing that I learned with that project, um, this sort of addresses the question uh, that Ryan, uh, or the, I guess Laura posed um, uh, about EEG stuff um, uh, and specific control. Um, with that piece, um, when I worked with Michael Sakamoto, that's the guy who was doing the Butoh hip hop, 
dance uh, with three walls, like one above him, bald guy. Um, uh, that with that piece, it's embedded within a larger evening long performance piece. And um, we were able to specifically uh, get the lighting and stage requirements that we needed because uh, Michael is uh, been doing dance performances for a long time and staging and directing. Uh, and so he knew the language of theaters and was able to actually get specific requests. Um, that's generally not the case when you're doing a music piece. Um, if you start, you know, if you walk on, you know, especially if you're doing like an eight minute, you know, piano piece within the context of another concert, um, I was never able to like be, you know, work on the lighting setup for two hours, let alone the sound setup for two minutes, you know? So um, to get a very specific outcome, you need to actually really build a very specific situation that's, that you can control. Um, and I learned with the lighting to actually just sort of embrace the fact that I couldn't control it and to look for the differences between what exists. So like whatever is my starting point and then when somebody moves in front of the camera. Um, and with the EEG, that was sort of the same thing is like, I had a very specific idea and I practiced and rehearsed and I could get specific outcomes. Um, but it took a lot of time, like, uh, you know, practicing four hours a day to get something, um, you know, get my brain to do something was just not worth the amount of, uh, effort. It was more the, the thing that I realized is that I could actually code something so that it would have the same sort of impact sonically and aesthetically in the piece. So that was sort of the solution I came up with. Okay. Um, I mentioned that I lived in Alaska for two years and I made uh, work uh, as part of a group called the Light Brigade. Um, this is an artist collective. Um, so I wanna show you um, a set of these works because um, during this time I wasn't really uh, associated with any academic situation. Um, I'd still go to conferences occasionally, but really I was just working with these people making these pieces and I was the lone musician in a, in a context of a, a sculptor, a dancer, and um, a poet and community activist, I guess is what I call Bruce. Um, and so here's uh, three of those pieces. You saw Solitude of Expanse, that was one of them, and that was uh, the bigness of Alaska, right? Um, so here's some work from the Light Brigade. Oh, and this is a showreel of sort of, you know, three works um, that are not really concert pieces. These are creative place making pieces. So these are artistic interventions within the community. During the summer of 2014, while passing through the longest combined railway and highway tunnel in North America, a very surprised but enchanted train car full of business entrepreneurs and investors found themselves suddenly enveloped in darkness and a composed soundscape, viewing through the train car window an immersive, highly saturated site-specific film upon the side of the tunnel. The 85-foot-long expanded cinema piece Tunnel Vision was being projected onto the tunnel's interior through six projectors mounted on the train car's exterior at angles calculated to correct for the profoundly uneven surface of the tunnel's rock and earthen walls. None of the more than 100 participants in the Anchorage Economic Development Corporation's annual Pitch on a Train event will ever forget that five and one half minute passage. To launch the Light Brigade's ongoing participation in the 2015 UNESCO declared Year of Light, we partnered with two leading local developers to take over and program the large scale rooftop light sculpture on their signature office building, JL Tower. Our programmer designers joined with our composer musician team members to create Frisson, an artist created light show synchronized to an audio work broadcast over a local FM radio station. For one memorable winter moment, Frisson punctuated the city's skyline. To close out 2014 and usher in 2015, we proceeded to break all of our old presentation rules and created a large scale interactive sound and light sculptural installation in a popular downtown park. 
Creating site-specific work means working with the sound palette that's already in place in the site. Especially now that the temperatures have dropped, it sounds a lot more arctic. I kind of feel like it matches the stillness of the atmosphere and how the poor cross has just sort of stilled everything. And there's just this sort of frozen sound quality that I think works very, very nicely. I think one of the most interesting things um, for me in this piece is actually the next 15 feet here. Um, this is the vantage point where you get the first light refracted by all of the the street lights coming down through the acrylic rods above us. Follow the light. Welcome thousands of visitors to an alternative world where mysterious shapes surrounded by an undulating and reflective light field evoked life on the ocean floor, another planet, or some future metamorphosis. And right away, we were drawn to the idea of it being interactive with visitors. Although Follow the Light coincided with the celebration of Anchorage turning 100 years old, its subject was the next 100 years of the city's life. We incorporated a nod to the past, however, in the form of the seven major sculptural elements that made up the installation's centerpiece. Each one was constructed from 1970s era municipal Christmas ornaments that once hung on light poles along the city's major streets. And people then, in their cars and on the sidewalks, followed the light of these Christmas ornaments. We also like the idea of taking something that is literally physically part of Anchorage's past and transforming it into a sign that, that points in the direction of the future. And why that symbolic is, is that that's how the future of anything and anybody in any place is always made. You take and build on what has come before it. Follow the Light also highlighted alternative energy sources, including solar and human powered among the installation's features, thus inviting the community to ponder questions important to our future. What can we do with the next 100 years? What will our sources of sustenance, employment, and energy be? How will we define wealth, health, happiness, and community? Visitors stream to the park each night of a three-week run in groups big and small. Many return to look, listen, and linger. Okay, so lots of questions about funding. <laughs> um, yeah, let's go to, I always like to stall at the end of that one, um, but I'm gonna move back just so I can see my notes on that. Um, I'll point out a couple of things uh, real quick. The train piece that you see, um, we uh, put speakers like the big uh, Mackies, like, you know, mm. There we go, you know, like that, huge ones up in the racks. Uh, so we had like six of those in there. Uh, and it's funny because people didn't even notice them. They were all on this train. Let's put the context together. People get on a train uh, and the Eco Anchorage Economic Development uh, Corporation would have this pitch on a train, like, you know, pitch for a new business. And so everyone's on this train getting ready to do their pitch for their business. And at the end, you know, have everyone having gone and made their pitch, the judges deliberate in a, and they announce the winner. So they're all there doing this thing. And like, we get into the tunnel at the end of the tunnel, they're going to announce it, but nobody knows that like, and nobody bothered to notice all these speakers um, and projectors mounted on the outside of the train. Um, so that's when we just boom, unleash. Um, uh, how do you get permission to do this? And how do you fund this? That's, that's sort of the, the two questions at hand though. Um, we partner with the community in as much as we're writing for grants. There's, there's actually in Anchorage, uh, in Alaska in general, um, there's recognition that um, the arts are a great way to improve the quality of life. Um, and Alaska has one of the highest um, suicide, alcohol, and abuse rates. Um, and so uh, they actually uh, try to 
um, attempt to deal with this by um, funding different projects that they think will have a positive impact. Um, and some of those uh, things that they're funding are art projects. And so that's one way um, and uh, that we would fund some of this. We also, you know, are just uh, kind of like get a big grant to do one project and then siphon off some of that money to do it into this other project or with the pitch on a train event, you know, they had a budget for, you know, sort of their entertainment cost. Um, and so, you know, we sort of fit into that and, you know, they thought it would be kind of a nice way of uh, marking the event. Um, I want to talk, uh, the second piece you saw is for Son. Uh, that is the tallest building in Anchorage. And you saw that light display. So, you know, Anchorage is dark in the winter, right? The sun comes up at like 11, goes down at two on a good day. Um, and uh, so, you know, people think about light differently. And so um, when Bruce says our designer, our program designers and our musicians paired, what he actually meant in the piece that you saw was that I went up there and I programmed the lights and then I went and made a piece of music. Um, and this was for me, sort of the first piece of telematic music. I should say there were other groups doing other installations with that light display, but in, you know, sort of my iteration, the one that I did, that's what I did. Um, I made a time score that was about 12 minutes long. And so you saw there were individual bars on that projection surface. And so I would turn on a light and then I would sound a sign tone and I just made an overtone series. And so you could kind of hear that in the background. And then over the top of that was a trumpet, a violin and an electric bass. You know, um, actually the bass player is from a ska band. Um, and he was my realtor when I lived in Anchorage. Um, and uh, so what we did for the opening of that event was um, we projected this video and uh, we played uh, we improvised. It was a you know constrained improvisation um, over the the fixed electronics and video. And um, I was in my house hosting a party, and I was playing the violin. And then I streamed in the trumpet and bass. And then the trumpet player had a different party, and the bass player had a different party. And so um, you know you would be the the audience each got a different perspective, um, and that was you know intentional because everyone has a different perspective when they see these lights, you know, they're driving by. Um, and that perspective is a result of where they are and also sort of their current situation. Um, and so we performed this concert, uh, recorded it, and then every night for a week, uh, you could turn on the radio um, at top of the hour and uh, you would hear the concert broadcast synchronized with the light show going on. Um, so that was sort of how it rolled out into the whole community. Um, and Follow the Light was the largest project that we did. Um, we took over that park for a month and then it happened to be a block from my house. So that meant going over there at all hours to sort of uh, make sure everything was okay <laughs> and still running. Um, that also meant leaving my computer in a bathroom for a month. Um, so that was kind of fun. Um, so uh, yeah, that's 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 that piece. Um, it's a large, that was a large community project. There was a lot of volunteers who came in and did things. Um, we, we would have wiring parties, you know, and we would get together and have a big potluck. It, the space that you saw was actually an, an old abandoned church that was donated to us. We call it the church of love. Um, it was a former, uh, Korean Baptist church in the, uh, red light district. It was next to all the sex shops in uh, downtown Anchorage and it had been abandoned. So we took it over and that's where we were doing the welding and the construction. Um, and uh, we would have big parties where people would, like bring moose stew and, you know, bread and whatever and homemade beer. And then we, you know, like, okay, we need to assemble 10,000 of these lights, you know, these led lights. And so you teach people to solder and off you go. Um, and then we would hire artists. Like, uh, to so the guy you saw welding, he was actually, we hired him specifically, you know, and so we'd spend our money on that. In terms of how did we arrive at our decisions, uh, I would say it was more like a rock and roll band. Uh, we all kind of, you know, we had a gentle person's uh, agreement, but we all argued about it um, in, in a good way. Um, yeah, yeah, those things do exist. Um, okay, so I have two more pieces that I want to talk about, and then I, I promise to stop. Um, okay, so fluorescent essence. This for me is sort of a, an important piece because it takes sound, transforms it into video, into a visual, and then visual back into sound. Um, this was written, uh, 
for Mark Brzezinski, he was a, is, I should say, a trombone player who lives in New York City, uh, teaches at Manus and plays around. Uh, he's gigged with like the New York Phil and stuff like that. Um, he's a good friend. We did our masters together. And uh, uh, my favorite thing about Mark is that uh, he's Mormon. So when we go out to bars, he orders a Diet Coke. Um, and I just love going around New York with him. It's just, it's always fun because he's always just making fun of me for being ridiculous. And that's just fun. Um, the other person that this is for or with is um, James Buckholz. And he's a fluid dynamics researcher at the University of Iowa. And so he looks at how do fluids um, move and uh, sort of what are the implications of that? Um, largely in a, you know, not in an artistic world. He's, he's functioning more in a, in a business world and in a pure science research world, right? Um, but uh, he and I were talking about um, how could we look at sound happening. And so we came up with this, which is we put a, I bought a plastic trumpet. Well, I don't have it on hand, but I, I bought a plastic trumpet because they're cheap and um, I drilled a hole in it. And then I uh, piped uh, smoke from a smoke machine into it. And then I had a trumpet player blow a note. Um, we constructed a very elaborate, um, uh, very um, impressive cardboard box around the bell of the trumpet. So there would be no dust. And then uh, we shot a laser, uh, like a very expensive, very dangerous laser uh, that I wasn't allowed to touch, uh, that when we would turn it on, we had to put on special glasses and lock the door from the inside so that no one could get into the room kind of laser. We'd shoot it through this box um, and uh, we had a hole for that. And then we had a hole for the camera. And uh, as the smoke emanated from the bell, you would get the, the wave unfolding in space. And so we'd shoot lots of pictures really quick. And then I had a hard drive full of a lot of black and white images of smoke clouds. Um, I assembled these into a video and that video became the score as it were for the piece, Fluorescence. Um, so how do you then turn these smoke uh, clouds into sound? Well, the way I did it uh, is I took the video space and I divided it into, I think this is, well, we'll say it's 11 uh, tones. And the, I looked at the spectral centroid of that smoke mass and um, that became which note the trombone player is gonna be playing. Um, and so there's four sections to the piece, there's four different arrays. Um, and that's, I just literally, you know, kind of draw it from there. Again, I'm using the mouse right to left to sort of uh, update the rate at which it's being analyzed. Um, so, you know, as with other projects, I don't just let it spit out the answer. I had to go back and massage the answer. Um, in addition to the trombone part, there's an electronics part. And I generated that with a similar process, but instead of looking at the mass of the entire thing, I drew blobs uh, or rather cv.jit drew blobs around different uh, areas and the mass of the blob determined the amplitude of the sine tone. So you see all these sine tones, they're all sounding and the louder it is, uh, or rather the more visually present it is in, in your visual cortex, the more you hear it, okay? Um, so the mass of the blob equals the amplitude of the sine tone. Um, a thing to say that I think is useful, um, you see that there's these four sine tones here, uh, oops, say here, right, uh, that are orange. Those are uh, similar to, or no, they're the same sine tones as in the second set uh, that are orange. And then the blue ones that are in the second set are the same as the blue ones in the third set. And then the third set has green and fourth set has green. So that's how I created uh, continuity throughout the piece, even though there's you know, changing um, sine tone masses. Um, so how do you put that all together? Well, you stick the trombone player on stage, you play back the video, and then you do some live processing of the trombone and you play back the fixed part. And it ends up being a little...
So I will just stop it there. You can go back and hear the whole piece. I'm happy to share it with you. Um, and I want to finish up with um, a different piece because what you've heard thus far is, um, well, the light brigade is not really, but um, the other pieces tend to be more of what I consider sort of the uh, concert music side of what I do. Um, and while this piece, uh, the first time you closed your eyes fits into that category, um, it also fits into something that I can sit down on the corner uh, with a, my amplifier that has batteries in it and uh, play it. Um, so the idea here is that um, I wanted to leverage the act of listening compositionally. Um, and uh, I came up with this strategy um, Oh, well, it was about two years ago, I guess. And um, the idea is um, I took recording of the wind chimes over there. There's six of them. I took recorded each bell. And then I took this beautiful uh, mono board. Um, so this is a single string off of a bass guitar. Um, and uh, there's a pickup in the bridge there and there's a pickup over here. So we got one string and two pickups, um, which gives me some nice uh, ability to control stuff. Um, I made another version that is also portable. These both fit inside of my uh, suitcase. Um, this one uh, down here, it mounts onto a log. So that's a board with a pickup and a tuning key. And then I put a screw in, you know, whatever piece of wood I find at the venue I show up in. And uh, you can, you know, kind of play uh, the play this thing. Um, and actually I get, I would find the bridge too. So this is like a seashell that I found. Um, uh, and the other cool thing about this is when you're done, you can burn the log. So, you know, it's like, it, it makes for a fun performance. Um, so the mono board, uh, you know, there's not a lot you can do with one string. Um, but that was sort of my intention is that I wanted to constrain myself and really think about what can I do. Um, so you do see that I'm using an Ebo, right? Um, so I have these six tones and I record um, sort of my impression of the beating pattern of the wind chimes. Um, and I make six recordings. And then I, I built a max patch, which plays them back in a randomized order. And it's, um, there's six files. So I play back one and two together, or sorry, one and two randomly in some random order. I don't know which order they're coming in. And then once one and two have played, then I play one, two, and three in some random order with some overlap. And then I play one, two, three, and four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, I six, and one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, three, two, one, done. Okay. Um, and my job as a performer as this is being played back is to basically harmonize with it, whatever that means to me. Um, and so I very delicately slowly turn up the volume, bring the Ebo in and tune. Um, and one of the challenges I set for myself is I don't want the audience to ever hear me changing the tuning of the string, um, which these are just constraints that I built for myself, but it actually it limited in a very interesting way. Um, I'll turn on this piece while I'm talking because I don't mind talking over it. It's, it's an exercise in listening uh, for me, the performer and for the audience, I think. And so this piece lasts 20 minutes. And really the, the best way to experience is just kind of like sit and let it happen. Um, so I built this piece so that it can work in mono. Uh, it also works in ambisonics. And so when I was in Norway, this is a scaffolding for uh, a 26 uh, channel ambisonic array. Um, and ambisonics allowed me to move sort of the individual sounds around in space as they're happening. So I just you know wrote some automation and off you go. Um, and what I love about this is first off, um, I'm in Norway for a festival and, um, my parents and my daughter and my wife are all there. So that was, that was super cool. But I get there on day one and I'm walking down the street and I'm like, oh, look at that. That's amazing. What's that for? And I'm like, huh, there's speakers on it. Huh. I recognize that person. Oh, Hey, it's Natasha Barrett. She's here too. Um, that must be where I'm performing. I'm like, Hey, Natasha, how are you? Um, didn't know you were going to be here too. Um, so it's just like one of these really happy moments. Um, and then the, for the performance, you know, it's like 10 below Fahrenheit and there's 15 people standing outside listening to this extremely boring static music, uh, you know, in the cold and they're standing there, you know, um, including my parents, which 
it was great. It was so fun. Um, and my daughter, who's seven months old at the time, she wasn't standing there. She was being carted around on the perimeter so she wouldn't interject too many interesting sounds into the performance. Um, but that's, um, you know, that that's this piece is really flexible and it's also really, um, you know, it's an opportunity to think differently about how we hear a piece and to invite sort of the sounds in the space into an acoustic performance. And so, um, yeah, that's the first time you closed your eyes. Oh, and that, that title is a provocation to the audience to remember the first time you closed your eyes and heard something um, because it's kind of a different way of thinking about sound. So, there's some information. I will post these things. Um, that's my website where there's these pieces and a bunch of other ones, papers if you want to read about them. Um, there's my email if you want to be in touch. There's a link to this talk. There's an HTML version. And then I'll say that I took the um, mono board and I made a um, uh, um, album that I could make during nap time. Right, so I'm, I, I stay at home with my daughter and she naps for a couple hours and I can come out and create a, uh, a compositional puzzle for myself. And uh, I just left the same convolution reverb on and made seven, well, I made 12 different recordings and picked seven that I like. Um, and that album was sort of um, thinking about with COVID, uh, everyone's sitting at home, staring out their windows, watching their neighbors walk by. Um, and so we're all together in this sort of interesting way that we've never been before. Um, and this was, you know, three months ago before it was really starting to grate on people's nerves like it is now. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I, I made that, that, that album and it's kind of a, a different way of thinking about using a single string. So I will put on my headphones. So if you want to talk to me, you can do that. And um, there's some questions over here. I should probably circle back around to hear answer. Thanks, everyone. Ah, hmm. uh, yes. So that is my email. I think it's misspelled. Really? Chris ought to for. I do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for a, a great presentation. Really enjoyed listening and seeing all that. And it's, I think, particularly enlightening to see work that is done outside of the academic context is really interesting um, because we can become isolated in that pursuit. Yeah. Um, um, so let me step out of the way and see if anyone has any questions who is, who is not me. Yeah, uh, it is a, it is a dream. <laughs> I'm very happy to be living it. Um, but let me address that. So the question, the, the statement is, yeah, being an avant-garde composer who can afford to take sailing trips seems like a dream. It is a dream, but the, the reality of that, of, of course, is also that um, uh, I, you saw Sheila whine. And one of my favorite statements that I heard Sheila make is my secret weapon is being really cheap. Um, Sheila, uh, I, will, I think she wouldn't mind me saying, lives in what used to be a auto mechanics garage in downtown Anchorage that she turned into her workshop uh, and still doesn't have running water. Uh, she has a porta potty outside. Um, and so she's really good, um, you know, at, you know, sort of uh, walking that reality. Um, yeah, uh, we, my wife and I, uh, when we got married, we, we were, we had some money. Uh, from that. And uh, the thing we decided to invest in was not a house um, that came years and years later, uh, was to really, uh, was to buy a boat. Um, and you can do that relatively cheaply. Um, I mean, and by relatively cheaply, I mean, you could, you can get one for 25 bucks and spend a lot of time on it, or you can get one for, you know, 10,000 and uh, not have to worry about dying. Um, so, uh, you know, but living on a boat, uh, which we did do for a while, uh, is not, I mean, yeah, it seems nice, but, um, you know, we have a, a, a kerosene stove that you have to dump alcohol in and light that and then light the stove and 
we have an ice box. We don't have a refrigerator. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, I've learned, I mean, the thing about mountaineering is that I learned to sort of live out of a backpack. Um, and so that, uh, taught me to think differently about, you know, what are the things that are important? Um, I am very fortunate, and I should totally acknowledge this, that I'm married to a physician uh, who holds similar values to myself. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the upside of that is that, you know, we're in a position now where she is working, uh, which a lot of people aren't in this current situation. Um, uh, of course, her life is on the line every day because she's dealing with COVID patients. Um, so there's there's that. Um, but it also, I mean, uh, going through school as, I'm, as you are now, um, the thing to say about uh, medical training is that her medical training began in 2001 and ended uh, 2014. And then she went back and did another fellowship. So it's a long time to be in school. That's a lot of debt. Um, so um, yeah, there's the, there's all of that stuff. Um, but that's also the reason I sort of point out why we turned our garage into a rental unit, right? Um, that's part of how do you fund these things? Um, yeah. Okay. What's this? Things and pieces. What is your thought process for composing with buildings and trains? Um, oh, right. Do I prefer Max over Super Collider, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so, I'll, okay. So the, I'm reading the question, so I'll, I'll verbalize them. Um, do you prefer one program over another, Max H or Super Collider, et cetera? Um, I prefer the thing that I know how to use. Um, and uh, I came to computer music, as I said, as a person um, isolated, um, living in Anchorage with no social contact because we were moving every six weeks. Um, so I amused myself by learning free software like PD, Super Collider, and C Sound. Um, so then when I showed up in uh, Santa Barbara, uh, I started learning Pro Tools and Macs. And uh, I found for me that Max MSP is sort of the easiest thing in terms of the way that I conceive the universe. Um, there's a lot of support. Uh, the downside is that it costs money. Um, but uh, for me, that's, you know, in terms of uh, making a piece of art, that's the tool that I, I probably land on most oftenly, um, or most often. So um, I don't really have a preference. It's just sort of what's the right tool for the project. Um, and the other part of that, which is maybe the more interesting and useful, is how do I, what's my thought process when building, you know, with making a piece that involves buildings and trains um, and that sort of stuff. Um, so those pieces um, often, how those pieces happen isn't sort of like someone walks up to me and says, will you make this piece of music for this building, right? Um, it's more like we as a group uh, would get together every week or two and we'd have pizza and a box of wine and we'd discuss sort of ideas. And uh, because we had this ongoing Follow the Light project, we were always meeting to discuss that. But then um, uh, I would say the brilliance of Bruce is that he's so involved in community uh, aspects of, uh, of life in Anchorage that he would um, uh, bring these opportunities to the group and um, so that's how like the building piece happened. Um, how do I think about that in terms of, um, uh, you know, making a piece for an audience? That's an important question. Um, with the train, um, we actually rode the train like four times uh, over the course of six months. And I made recordings of the noise level of the floor of the train, right? Because you're not trains are not quiet. So like, how do you project over that? You're not going to like get people to put headphones on, you have to project over it. So actually, I did an analysis of the uh, sort of most prominent uh, acoustic uh, components. So I looked at that and I said, Okay, my piece cannot use these frequencies, I have to compose around that. Um, and then um, I had to think about uh, the video was made by Michael Walsh. Um, and so I had to work sort of in conjunction with Michael's ideas. Um, he actually works with film, which was really kind of fun. Uh, um, he, um, 
he had this video idea and so we put together sort of what we were thinking and then we started you know basically just back and forth um and then there's just the element of you know who's your audience right it's a bunch of people who are distracted by are they going to win the bid uh are they going to win this pot of money for their for their business dream um and so we wanted to make something that would kind of like pull them out of it and and really look at the world around them and hopefully have this amazing experience and so you know there's like how do you design wow you know in your in your art um that it depends on the space. And so I really had to get to know the space. Um, and so I spent in these creative placemaking pieces, I really would spend a lot of time in the space. And by a lot of time, I mean like, you know, four or five hours a day for, you know, uh, two, three times a week for a couple months and like getting to know the space and, and trying to figure out what would work and then sort of imagining the piece. Uh, and the same as I would for a concert piece, right? Like you kind of rehearse it, you you like lay back, close your eyes and watch it happen on stage. Um, so it's, it's that same sort of process, but uh, relative to the space. Um, oh, when did you learn to sail? I was on a boat when I was three months old um, and uh, I grew up sailing uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin um, and second oldest yacht club in the United States. New York is the first, Milwaukee is the second. Um, and uh, I raced as a child um, on lasers, lightnings, and 470s. Um, and so I'm very good at making boats go uh, under sail. And as I got older, I learned uh, how to work on diesels uh, and how to uh, <laughs> be a captain, <laughs> which means assuming all the responsibility for everyone's life on board. Um, so yeah, that's been an ongoing process. Um, oh, mono string music is distracting. Ha, huh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm reading this in uh, delayed time. Um, uh, oh, you can, yeah, you can tune into it. It's probably better than tuning into me. Um, oh, how to tie knots. Yeah, uh, there's a story or two. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any others? Oh, there were a couple questions earlier. Let me just review this chat to make sure I answered everything. <laughs> Sorry. I think you got a lot of it. Um, I was going to ask about the choice to move to Anchorage, and I wondered if that had anything to do with the opportunity afforded by an oil-rich mm. state that craves art over um, alcoholism and suicide. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, look at the election results for Alaska um, to see where they really stand um, in light of that statement um, or in, in reaction to that statement. Um, Alaska is a weird place. Uh, the, the simple thing to say is everyone there is running from something. Um, I've heard that said, and I think it's actually true in a way. Um, the wonderful thing about Alaska is that it's a big, small town. You get on an airplane and uh, somebody knows somebody. Um, this happens to me still. I go to Alaska and I'm like, oh, huh, I haven't seen you in years. You know, it's like, it's that kind of place, even though it is so massive, right? It's, you know, it's the largest state. And if you put two of Texas in it, it's still the largest state, right? Like it's two and a half times as big as Texas. It's amazing. Um, uh, the reason we went there is, um, my wife's dream had been to be a uh, doctor on expeditions going up mountains. So like Everest and Denali and these sorts of things. Um, and then to live in a remote place and fly a float plane or a ski plane into um, you know, a hospital and work there. Um, she found out that flying in those little planes is not a lot of fun. And that ended that part of the dream. Um, but she was still very interested in um, uh, Alaska. And that's something we've sort of both been, we met because we were both ice climbers. So um, we went there uh, for a very specific reason, you know, like this sort of adventure part of the world. And that's, um, that's, a, that's very important 
thing for us. Um, and she was work. She found a job at the uh, Alaska Native uh, Tribal Health Consortium, which is the main hospital for all the Native population in Alaska. So if you're Native, you get free health care, um, but you just have to fly to Anchorage to get it. Um, so you know these small towns, like way out there, you know they're coming in to get. Um, uh, to get healthcare, and um, it's it was a very interesting situation. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, population to have spent a lot of time interacting with. We got to go to a lot of really wonderful and interesting places, and a lot of people were very, very kind to us and welcoming us into their communities. Um, so uh, we had gone there to, for, you know, so she could have this job, and um, it was at a time where I was looking at different jobs and basically she had a better offer than I did. And so I said, okay, well, you know what? I won't go into academic things right now. We'll go there and I'll figure something else out. And um, I had seen the light brigade, they, they existed before me um, doing work. And uh, so I contacted them and, um, oh yeah, I should say we were looking at living in Los Anchorage or Los Angeles. Those were the two cities we were considering. Um, and the opportunity just felt better to us to go to Anchorage. So we did. And I had sent an email to the Light Brigade like two months before. Nobody responded. And the day we move up there, I get an email from them. And I'm like, okay, great. Let's hang out. Let's have a beer. You know, I'm here. Um, and uh, it just kind of blossomed um, from there. Um, it has its challenges. Um, you know, like I'll, I'll say like the bass player that I worked with, he's, he's a great real estate agent, but he's actually also a really great bass player, uh, like moved up there from Pittsburgh and, uh, you know, uh, he plays in a ska band, but he was willing to do this kind of like experimental music as well. Um, so a lot of people do a lot of different things. Um, yeah, the oil money, not so much these days. Um, uh, I would recommend that you listen to the podcast, um, Alaska News Nightly, and you can listen to the news of like the debates they're having right now about uh, getting rid of um, uh, drilling and sort of the politics of all that. Um, there is what's called the permanent fund where you get a check from the government every year for, uh, I don't know what it's at, like $2,000 right now. Um, and uh, that's nice. You have to live there for two years um, before you get it. So we moved out right before uh, we got before we qualified for that. So I never did get that money. Um, that is one way that a lot of people do survive though in Alaska is like, you know, they hunt and uh, live off the grid and have children to collect dividend checks. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very different perspective. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much for your perspective. And um... <laughs> Certainly enjoyed having you on. I think I'm going to end this for our Facebook uh, folks. So goodbye, Facebook people. Okay, we're no longer on Facebook. And um, yeah, I appreciate you doing this. I think it's really great to have the perspective that you bring. I particularly enjoy the sound to video to sound aspects and all things associated with that. Uh, and I, I find it interesting that you were doing this sort of analyzing of the um, airflow from a trombone or trumpet before it was popular with the COVID thing. So forward looking. Oh, I forgot about that. That's yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they did a lot of research uh, after you did it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but with that, I think I have to end the meeting. So it was great seeing you. Great yeah, hearing great. from you. Uh, we'll talk more and I will make this um, presentation, I guess this HTML page links us to the presentation where we can hear more of your work and so forth uh, in more detail. Yeah. Um, so with that, I'm going to end the recording and end the meeting. Okay. Thank I'll you. Just say, I'll just say thank you to everyone. I didn't get to address all of you, but I've been staring at your beautiful faces there. And thanks for the questions. And um, yeah, I hope it was useful. Please be in touch if you want to discuss or ask anything. I'm happy to share.